Well, two comments I hear most often about the book of Revelation are, I've never studied it before. That seems to be the most common. I've never studied it before. Or, or I studied it once, but I don't understand it. Uh, others say, well, nobody can really know what Revelation means, so it's just kind of a waste of time. So they just ignore it. Uh, a comment I've never heard is, I just love Revelation. It's my favorite book. I've never heard anyone say, start a conversation with, you know, I was having my devotions in the book of Revelation this morning, and the Lord showed me X, Y, Z. Well, these days, people approach Revelation out of curiosity. With their Bible in one hand and a bunch of newspaper articles in the other, as they try to figure out which current world leader is the Antichrist, when will the tribulation begin, and how close are we to the rapture? And they come away confused because Revelation doesn't answer any of those questions. You see, when you ask the wrong questions, you're going to get the wrong answers. That's why it's important for us to let Scripture speak for itself, to interpret Scripture with Scripture, and avoid the assumptions behind what we've been calling newspaper eschatology. Well, we are in the third of the seven parallel vignettes in Revelation, the seven trumpets of judgment in Revelation 8 through 11. And last week, we looked at the first half of that, um, the first six uh, uh, trumpets in chapters 8 and 9. And this morning, we turned to chapters 10 and 11 that deals with an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Um, now, just as there was an interlude between the sixth and seventh seals, here we find a similar interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets. Now, hopefully, by now we're beginning to see the parallel relationship between these vignettes and reveal, that reveal God's plan for the church in the last days, which began with Jesus' first coming and end with his second coming. So if you turn with me to um, Revelation 10, verse 1. John writes, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. And he had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the seven thunders, what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. Now, there are a lot of Old Testament and New Testament symbols packed into this last half of this vignette. Now, John's description of an enormous mighty angel coming down out of heaven uh, is, is one of those things that is hotly debated. A um, number of things in this passage are hotly debated. So one of the tools in our toolbox of biblical interpretation is what is known as the rule of faith. Now, the rule of faith is the practice of looking to Scripture to interpret Scripture. So from John's use of these biblical symbols, we can infer the meaning of this text. Now, here he describes another mighty angel coming down from heaven, and that's in contrast to the angel that fell from heaven that we saw last week at the beginning of chapter 9. Now, we identified that fallen angel as Satan, who was given the keys to the bottomless pit. Now, the mighty angel we see here symbolizes the power and presence and glory of God among his people in difficult times. Now, are there any clues as to just who this mighty angel might be? Some say it's one of the archangels, specifically Michael. Others just say, well, we don't know. Well, he's coming down to earth in a cloud which is exactly the way the two angels told the disciples Jesus would return when he ascended into heaven in, in Acts chapter 1, um, verses 10 and 11. 
The cloud also reminds us of the cloud of God's Shekinah glory that filled the tabernacle in the wilderness and later filled the temple. The glory of his face, described as bright as the sun, is the way John described Jesus in chapter 1, verse 16. The brightness of his face shining through the cloud produces a rainbow, the symbol of God's covenantal faithfulness to his people after the flood. In Revelation, the only other one we see encircled with a rainbow is God himself seated on the throne. His legs, like pillars of fire, are reminiscent of God's presence and protection of his people as he, as he led them out of Egypt into the promised land with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. His left foot on the land and his right foot on the sea suggests that he has authority over all the earth. Another small but significant detail here is that his right foot is not in the sea, but it's on the, it's on the sea. This angel walks on water. Now, who does that remind you of? In chapter five, verse five, John identifies Jesus as the Lion of Judah. And here the angel roars like a lion and the seven thunders answer. Now this mighty angel coming down out of heaven appears to have all of the attributes of God. Now scholars that I highly respect and rely on agree that this sounds an awful lot like Jesus, but they insist that it's not Jesus because John never refers to Jesus as an angel in Revelation. And that's their strongest argument. But who else could it be? Yet they fail to mention the many instances in the Old Testament where we see what are called Christophanies. And these are pre-incarnation appearances of the Son of God, who is often called the angel of the Lord. Now, we can't be dogmatic here, but as reasonable people, we can follow the evidence to its logical conclusion. And I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to suggest that this angel who appears at the end of this vignette represents the second coming of Christ right before the blowing of the seventh trumpet and the final judgment. Now, he has a scroll in his hand. This is uh, a different scroll from the one with the seven seals that we saw in the second vignette. Jesus was the only one who was worthy to take that scroll and to open its seals. This little scroll is not sealed, and it's given to John. And it represents the things that God has fully revealed to us, particularly the gospel and his plan of salvation. But there are things that God has chosen not to reveal to us, as evidenced by the seven thunders. Of all the groupings of seven that we find in Revelation, and there are more than 50 of them, of all these groupings, the seven thunders remain a mystery that God has chosen not to reveal to us. There are forces and factors at work in history and in his plan that we are not privy to. No one can discover what the seven thunders said because God expressly forbids John to write it down. Now, there are other examples of this um, intentional concealment throughout Scripture. In Acts chapter 1, verse 7, um, when the disciples asked Jesus before he ascended into heaven, is it now that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. In 2 Corinthians 12, 4, when Paul was taken up into the third heaven, it says that he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, we are told that the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. British theologian John Stott wisely points out that it is arrogant and immoral for us to pry into things that God has not disclosed to us. We must be content to live with our ignorant on, ignorance on such things. Verse 5, And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, 
who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that the days of the trumpet call, but in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. There is no more delay. This is the last day. The end has come. The Lord has returned. The final trumpet has sounded and the final judgment has commenced. Everything prophesied in God's word has now been fulfilled at this point. Now, this is another objection, though, that the commentators raise to identifying this angel as the Lord. Um, it's that he raises his right hand and swears to God, which they say indicates that he is less than God. He's an angel. He's not God. Now, I have three responses to the this objection, and they come from another New Testament book that Christians routinely avoid, and that's the book of Hebrews. Now, the first has to do with the claim that swearing by God shows that this angel is inferior to God. If we look at Hebrews 6, verses 13 through 18, the writer writes, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Second, this objection seems to overlook the fact that Jesus is God. Again, from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 12, this is God speaking. And it says, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And third, they overlook the fact that Jesus himself is the creator. Hebrews 1.10. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same. And your years will have no end. This is God speaking, God the Father speaking to God the Son. Now, another clue that this might be Jesus is found in what is spoken by the prophets in verse 7 and its connection to Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, where we read, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Verse 8. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went, I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Now, the little scroll represents the gospel that is to be proclaimed and lived out during this present new covenant age. 
Who knew better than John both the joy and the bitterness of following Jesus and obeying the gospel? The gospel is proclaimed and many receive it with joy, but for those who believe, it is often followed by hardship and persecution and even martyrdom. It's sweet in their mouth, but it's bitter in their stomach. Uh, here, John's apostolic ministry is then reaffirmed, and he is to continue to preach this message. Now, here's a little insight into John's future. John didn't die on the island of Patmos. According to church history, he was released and returned to Ephesus where he served that congregation for several years uh, until his death. Well, that's the end of chapter 10. And, and in chapter 11, the scene shifts to a vision of the temple. 11.1 1 says, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, it is, it's probable that the temple that John sees in this vision is Herod's temple in Jerusalem. Uh, even though it had been destroyed by the Romans nearly 20 years earlier in fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy that not one stone would be left standing on another. This is a vision. But those who take a literalistic approach to Revelation interpret this to mean that the temple will be rebuilt sometime in the future. But the literal interpretation of this passage is that John is seeing a vision of the temple as it once was. It cannot be construed to mean that the literal temple was either still standing or that it will be rebuilt before the Lord returns. Now, in the New Testament, the temple of God is not a physical building unless it's actually referring to the building in Jerusalem as it stood in Jesus' day. But in, it, is, it is consistently the church. It's the body of Christ. And John's vision of the temple represents the church and those worshiping there are believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The command to measure them indicates God's protection as well as his ownership. It's the equivalent of the symbolic numbering of the 144,000 who were sealed by God back in chapter 7. We see this throughout the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Anyone who destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. In Ephesians 2, uh, 20 through 22, Paul says that, we are the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. Now, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in his Olivet Discourse, but neither he nor any of the apostles say anything about it ever being rebuilt as a sign of the last days. I think it's quite telling that the entire New Testament is silent on the subject of the temple being rebuilt. Well, John is not um, told to measure the outer court because it's given over and trampled underfoot by the nations throughout this, this age. The fact that they're not measured indicates that they are outside of God's protection and that he has given them over to suffer the consequences for rejecting him. And we come to the two witnesses, another hotly debated um, figure in the, in the book of Revelation. Verse 3 says, um, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, there are some who believe that these two witnesses are literally Moses and Elijah, 
because they appeared with Jesus at the Transfiguration and represent the law and the prophets. Others believe that they are Enoch and Elijah because neither of them died but were both caught up into, into heaven and that they're now sent back in the last days to preach the gospel. But that begs the question, does this granting of authority um, to these prophets mean that up until this point, there has been some deficiency in the Bible or in Jesus and the apostles' teaching that needs to be corrected or clarified by the appearance of these Old Testament saints. Again, this is a literalistic interpretation based on no more than a wild guess. Jesus said that John the Baptist had fulfilled the prophecy in Malachi that Elijah would appear before the end of the age. We'll get back to the identity of these two witnesses in verse 4, but the other hotly debated element in this passage is what does 1,260 days stand for? Now, there, this period of time is also referred to as 42 months, up in verse 2, three and a half years, a time, time, and half a time. Now, the literalistic interpretation says that since these various time periods all equal three and a half years, it is assumed that they refer to the second half of the seven-year tribulation. But since Revelation never mentions a seven-year tribulation, this interpretation is doubtful. Time, ref time references in Revelation are symbolic, as are most all the other numbers in this book. Now, three and a half years is significant because it has cultural associations in Jewish history. Now, we have similar cultural associations uh, in our history, and they require no context for us to grasp their meaning. For example, four score and seven. We all know what that stands for, right? Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War. How about 1776? We instantly know that that's the year uh, of the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War. How about 9-11? See, these things don't require any context for us to grasp their meaning. It's the same um, for the times, time, time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years, or all these other references to three and a half years. For the Jews, it brings to mind the tyrannical reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes and the Maccabean revolt of 167 to 164 BC, three and a half years. Now these variations of three and a half years were synonymous then with se severe testing, tribulation, and suffering in the collective cultural context of John's day. Now, John symbolically, symbolically equates this time reference with the entire period of tribulation experienced by the church in the world during this present age, from the first coming of Christ to his second coming. Well, who are these two witnesses, these two prophets? Verse 4 says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Now, the two witnesses are now referred to as two olive trees and two lampstands. Again, we have another one of these shifting pictures in, in Revelation. In verse 10, they are called two prophets. Now, throughout Scripture, the truth is verified by at least two witnesses. So the purpose of these two witnesses is to verify and attest to the truth. These two witnesses are now referred to as olive trees, two olive trees and two lampstands. Now, again, let's apply this rule of faith and let Scripture interpret Scripture. Where do we find two olive trees listed in Scripture? Zechariah talks about two olive branches, but these are two olive trees. Well, in Romans chapter 11, 
where Paul describes the church as made up of natural branches from the cultivated olive tree and grafted in branches from a wild olive tree, we see the image of an olive tree, which is the church. Now in that illustration, he's describing the church as consisting of both Jews and Gentiles. Then there are the two lampstands. The lampstands in Revelation are the seven churches in, in uh, chapters two and three. Now of the seven, only two are faithful. Do you remember those? Smyrna and Philadelphia. Now we've already seen in Hebrews 6 that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he promises and he swears an oath that inaugurated the new covenant and established the church as the pillar and support of the truth. Now these two witnesses the two olive trees, the two lampstands who testify to the truth symbolize the church and the church's witness in the world. The ultimate faith, fate of fiery destruction for those who harm the church is the lake of fire and the second death. It doesn't come immediately, but it will come eventually. In 1 Corinthians 3.17, it says, if anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are his temple. Verse 6. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now, remember, this is apocalyptic language. And John is drawing on the Old Testament imagery of the judgments called down by Elijah and Moses as symbolically, as they symbolically continue um, by the church through the preaching of the gospel. Verse seven, and when they had finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where their Lord was crucified. Now, verse seven is the first, introduces the first of two beasts that we find in Revelation. And many, without any evidence at all, just assume that this first beast is the Antichrist, just as they assume without any evidence that there are seven years of tribulation or that the temple will be rebuilt. But as we've pointed out before, John is the only New Testament writer who uses the term antichrist, but he never uses the, the term in Revelation, oddly enough. So if this beast is the antichrist, John has missed yet another opportunity to identify him here. Now, a detail that I've noticed after reading this book literally dozens of times in the last few months is that every living being, whether it's God, Jesus, an angel, one of the 24 elders, or Satan, the devil, the dragon, or the serpent, they are all consistently referred to as he. But neither one of the two beasts mentioned in Revelations are ever referred to as he. They are always referred to as it. Which leads me to believe that the beast that rises from the pit of hell is symbolic of something other than a living being. This beast makes war and kills the two witnesses. This is demonic, state-sponsored persecution of Christians carried out by atheistic governments that are part of the world system that is hostile toward God. Now, at some point, the mission of the church will be finished. It'll be completed. The gospel will have been preached throughout the whole earth and the elect who are predestined to salvation from the foundation of the world will have been saved and then the end will come. The final hellish assault against the church seems to be decisive. And for a brief time, just prior to the end, it will appear to be, it, it will appear to the world that Christianity has finally been eradicated and they will celebrate, but only for a short time. 
three and a half days. Verse 9, for three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. Now, this can only be the resurrection of the saints and the rapture of the church at the second coming. And there's nothing secret about it. Everybody sees it. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Now, after the resurrection of the saints and the rapture of the church, when Jesus appears, then there comes the final judgment of unbelievers. 11.13 says, And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, this does not suggest that at the end of the age, there will be a great ingathering of last-minute believers. At this point, the opportunity has passed. The saints have been resurrected, resurrected and raptured. The age of grace has ended. It's over. And Paul tells us in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, that on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, whether or not they are believers. Now, the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Finally, we come to the seventh trumpet this third woe in verses 15 through 18. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, now pay attention to the verb tenses here. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the throne uh, on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, and we really want to hear, and who is to come. Because that's the way that phrase goes, that clause goes throughout Revelation, but not here. There is no and is to come because he has come. For you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations raised, but your wrath has come. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Well, the blowing of the seventh trumpet corresponds to the breaking of the sixth seal in the previous vignette. The final judgment is the separating of the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. Judgment and condemnation for the wicked who will hear him say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. And justification and reward for the saints who will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And Revelation 
eleven nineteen says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Now here we have yet another vision of the temple, only now it is no longer on earth, but it is in heaven, representing the church. The Ark of the Covenant now refers to the new covenant in which God says to his church, I will be your God and you will be my people and I will be merciful to your iniquities and your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Then the third vignette ends in the same way the second vignette of the seals ended in chapter 8, verse 5, with flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and an earthquake and heavy hail. Would you pray with me? Father, these terrifying images that, um, that we see in, in Revelation catch our attention and cause us to bow before you in awe. We pray, Father, that we would take these things to heart and that if there are things in our own lives that would displease you, if we are kidding ourselves with regard to whether or not we are truly believers, we pray, Father, that you would wake us up and that you would cause us to repent of our sin so that we might be part of that great company who stands before your throne and gives you praise and worship on that day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.